Henny, uh, welcome again, and it's just great that you, to have you here with us today. And uh, but could you comment on how it was like as a player and having those three thousand uh, Canadian fans there with you? Well, I don't think we would have won without them, and I'll tell you why. We lost the first game, and we're skating off the ice. We had to go by the Canadian contingent, and they stood up and gave us an incredible standing ovation. Uh, amazing after loss. And then it, it was a miserable night in Moscow. And we got back to the hotel an hour later. And there was several hundred outside the hotel. We got off the bus and they went crazy again. The fact that most of them were hammered has got nothing to do with it. And, uh, <laughs> and they sang the Canadian national anthem. And you'll remember this, John, with such fervor. And even we were not, Peter Mohavlich talked about this the other days. There was, there was goosebumps on our arms. It wasn't mine too. That's with the passion and, and fervor that they sang the, the national anthem. And they were there for us and we sure appreciated them. <laughs> so Henny, let's, uh, <clears throat> let's step back to training camp. Um, what, what were you trying to prove? And, and maybe a follow-up, how did you get in the lineup for eight, all eight games? Well, Ronnie Ellis and I were invited, and we knew we would get a center ice winner because <clears throat> there were seven of each position. And the one person we didn't want to get was Bobby Clark because we were probably looked at seventh line then. <clears throat> and sure enough, we go to camp, and the first practice, we're together. And so we went out and had a couple of beers afterwards, and Ronnie and I really wanted to play in Toronto. And uh, we said, let's go out there and work our rear end off and hopefully we can play in Toronto. And we didn't know Clark very well, but boy, you didn't have to motivate him very much with anything. So anyway, we really got serious early. And the, and the goal was that we would be, play the game in Toronto. Well, as camp went on, I mean, some guys hardly even worked up a sweat because, you know, we had so much power, we were gonna kill them anyway. So anyway, we played a couple of uh, red-white games, and uh, I scored two goals. Clarky got one in the other game, and both Clarky and I scored in the other one. And it became obvious that we were, <clears throat> and really what we we're trying to do is be the shutdown line. We we're all good offensive players, but Ronnie especially are great defensive players, and so is Clarky and I. And so we knew we weren't going to be an all, you know, <clears throat> uh, a liability. And it became clear to everybody, we were probably the best line. And we knew we were going to play in Montreal, and we did. And actually, Clark and I scored, and we only had one goal scored against us. And it was a sixth game when it was all over. And we were the only line that uh, got to play all eight games. But I would tell you, if we'd have got any other center iceman, I don't think that would have happened. Because he, he was just a really younger Norm Ullman, and Ronnie and Normie and I played for six years with the Leafs. So we were so fortunate in so many different ways. And, uh, and so we made the team, and we're the only line that played all eight games. So, Henny, uh, it seems like you had um, your team had very little respect for the Soviets uh, uh, at the beginning, but that, that, that changed very quickly. Uh, can you uh, explain that? Well, I mean, we knew they were good hockey players, but <clears throat> think of the firepower we had. We had 12 Hall of Famers on that team. And it's like today, if you get a first place team playing a last place team, the first place team is going to win most of the games. And, uh, um, and uh, so we, we, we totally underestimate them, but Phil scored right off the bat. And I scored at the six minute mark went back to the bench and Clarkey and Ronnie remember me saying that. I looked at them and said, this is going to be a very long series. We knew in the first six minutes, I mean, they came up the ice, they didn't look like what they looked like and they went back, turned around and went back. If you played for Punch Imlock and you went back, you were on the bench. He didn't, he didn't even like a drop pass for goodness sakes. And poor Dryden, they just, they had that cross ice passes Every time he thought they were going to shoot it, they passed it. When he thought they were going to pass it, they shot. And, and, and he was totally discombobulated. So it was a huge, huge wake-up call. And one of the most embarrassing times of my life. I, I remember after the game, I thank God I'm not the coach because we have got to make changes. So, Henny, you, 
you lost that game, you won in Toronto, you tied in Winnipeg, and you lost then in Vancouver. How, how crushing was that loss in Vancouver? We didn't have a good game. In fact, I, I, our line, I don't think we had hardly any scoring opportunities. To throw. And the, you know, the, club, the, the crowd were disappointed. And, uh, and they got on us. And it didn't feel good, but in, in hindsight, we probably deserved it. But then that's when Phil, and, and you know, the interesting thing, we never saw, and even Phil never saw that interview for years later. And it was, well, Phil was the, our leader on and off the ice. We had four captains, but he was a leader. And, uh, and I got to give uh, Johnny Esau credit. He just let him go. And it was one of the all time great speeches. And that's when the Canadian people woke up. Oh my God, these guys need some help. And we got over there, we got bags of emails and, and uh, telegrams. It was incredible, but uh, yeah, that was the low point. In fact, we went back. Our families didn't even want to talk to us. <laughs> so you you stopped in Sweden on, on your way to Russia and you kind of re regrouped there. Could you explain that? Well, we, we need to get used to the larger ice surface. And we were finally getting down to, you got 35 guys and only 17 could dress. And so you got a lot of guys that are want to get on the ice. We had Hall of Famers that you know, we're not very happy. They wanted to get into the game, but we were finally getting down to this was going to be the basic team. And so it took a while to, uh, to cohese. And what and our line was the shutdown line. We were going to play against them, which we did play it against Karlamov and Ronnie did a great job uh, checking him. And so it, it brought us together because like we, we didn't really like each other. We had to play against them all the time. So it takes a while to come together as a team. And, and I don't think we'd ever won the series had we not gone over there. And it got a little ugly in a couple of games, but we got the, we got to Moscow and this was basically going to be a odd change here and there, but that's where I think even after we had a lot of time together as a team and we had a couple of sort of get togethers that probably drank too much, but it, it, it brought us together. So now you're in Moscow and uh, you're skating, uh, you're practicing, and uh, John Ferguson took you aside and had a little chat. Uh, what was that all about? <laughs> One of the great memories, you know, he was a pretty tough guy. And we're skating around and uh, he comes over to me and he said, you know, Henny, <clears throat> we need your line to come up big. And uh, this ice surface is made for you and uh, we're counting on you to score some goals. So we just want, I want you to let you know that we're really counting on you. And, you know, I, I was not a Hall of Famer or anything like that. And, but, you know, everybody needs encouragement every once in a while. And I went back and told my wife what he said. And, he, like, I can remember it uh, to this day that just, oh, my gracious, you know, they're counting on me. And, uh, and I was able to tell Fergie after we had a reunion a few years and I said, and I took him aside and I said, Fergie, you have no idea what that encouragement did to me. It gave me such confidence. And I guess that, well, if they're, cons you know, they're counting on me, I hopefully will do half decent. It's a good reminder for us, isn't it? To, to be encouragers. And then certainly Paul, you have been that way uh, as, since I've known you, but um, so now, uh, you lose game five, as, as John mentioned, and, uh, but, but Canada bounced back and you won game six and seven. And Henny, you scored the winning goals in game six and seven, but can you describe the game seven goal? <laughs> <laughs> well, I did, well, and Kurtz will back this up. I could, I'd never even play an old timer. Kurtz was my center raceman. I couldn't even, I couldn't go through the whole team even in old timer hockey. I mean, my, my asset was my speed, but you know, Perot would go through the whole team. And in fact, in Detroit, they used to call me chopper because of my stick handing ability. <laughs> they had to get new pucks after every practice so I was stick handling. But, you know, I, I, I knew it was gonna be the last shift I had. And I think there was about two minutes left in the game when we, uh, two and a half minutes in. And Savard hit me at center ice with a pass. And initially, what I thought I would do, I scored that winning goal in the sixth game. I used the defenseman as a, as a screen, and I 
snapped it before I think Krejcik was ready. But I went up, and for some reason, I tried to make a move on it, and it worked. And uh, the only time in my life I ever beat two defensemen. And I, as I went around him, I knew I wanted to go to the top corner, and the guy tripped me. And so on the way down, it actually helped me, and I put it right under the crossbar. And, and it was just a beautiful, beautiful goal. In fact, I scored seven goals. Six were really nice goals. And the last one was a bloody garbage goal. And I've had to listen to Henderson makes a wild stab forward and falls. Everybody <laughs> loves hearing that, don't you? So anyway, it went in the net and I haven't quit celebrating for 50 years. <laughs> so 50 years ago, uh, what were your feelings as the sun rose in Moscow on the 28th of September? Well, I, I told Eleanor, if we don't win the last three games, we're going to be known as the biggest losers in the history of Canadian hockey. And every one of us felt the same way. This would be a total embarrassment. But, but what I should have said, after we lost the, fir the first game in Moscow, and I actually scored two goals in that game, we had, for the first time, Sindon come in and he said, you know, guys, for the first time, we've outplayed them. We're getting in shape. And he said, all I want you to do is think about grain six. Don't think about nothing more. Let's take care of grain six. We did that, game seven and game eight. And so now we were getting in shape. So we were fairly confident. Uh, that's for sure. But you're down by two goals uh, at the end of the second. What was it like in the locker room? Well, there was, I, I, it was good. And I think that we were, we really felt, I, I, you know, I guess maybe it's, a, we really felt that we we're going to win. I remember going over and I touched Kenny uh, uh, Dryden and I, and I hit him and I said, you board this sucker up and we'll win the game for you. But you cannot let a bloody goal in. It's, it's, like I, Ronnie Ellis never says a word in his life and I never shut up in the dressing room. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I look back, what were you think? But you know, you do things instantly. And so, yeah, it was. And 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 Cindy comes in and he says, guys, if we can get one early, we'll be in good shape. And then Peter Mohavlich made a great play to Esposito in the in the slot. And I, I think Esposito was the best player I've ever seen in the slot. And he put one in, and then Cornmoyer scored and tied it up, and there we go. So Word, from what I understand, word came down to your team that Moscow or the Soviets were going to claim victory if the game ended in, in a tie because they had scored more goals in the series. So now uh, you have a minute left. Uh, Savard is out on D. And I don't know who was his partner, but Esposito, Pete Mahal, and Jivan Cornway are, are out there. There's a minute to go. And suddenly uh, you start yelling at Pete Mahovlich. What was that all about? Well, what happened is I back it up just a little bit. Our line was out on the ice and we come off with about two minutes left in the game. And he sent Sin, or Harry Sinden sent out Esposito, Cornway and uh, Mahovlich. And then he came down to us and said, and you know, the next line up was Gilbert, Rattel and Hull their turn but he come down and he said if there's any time left you guys are up so we knew we we're up so i'm just sitting there and and about the one minute mark left in the game i did something i never did before never did it again i got to get on the ice we got to win this game and so i did i stood up and started yelling at peter mohavlich and frank was sitting beside me he said, what the hell are you doing and i did and so anyway and you know i asked Peter about this in, in Ottawa the other day, I thought he heard me. And he said, Henny, honest to God, I didn't. I was just tired and I just come off. <laughs> and so, and, and because he's, so anyway, I jump over the boards and, and uh, Cornway had it at the far side. And I was a, a right-hand shot coming off the left wing. And I was hoping to give it to Austin Matthews, you know, the one timer. And, and, but he put it too far in front of me. And I fall into the boards afterwards. And I remember thinking, I still have time. I can, you know, I went through the whole team. I can do this again. And I get up just like that. And then Phil whacked it at Trechiak and he should never have let the rebound out. 
but I panicked. Oh my God, the puck's here. <laughs> so I probably should have pulled it back and, and I shot it there. and he got it with his pad and then it uh, come right back to me. And then I had about a foot to put it in. And, uh, and you know, the funny part about it is not funny, but there was a touch of melancholy. The puck went over the line and I had, my dad died in 68, but I had not thought of my dad. It went over the line and I said out loud to myself, dad would have loved this one. Isn't that amazing? The father, son, con and I jumped into Cornway's arm and that's why he said to have a, a back operation because I cugged on him. And both of us were saying, we did it, we did it, we did it. <laughs> there you go. So now you're back in Canada and uh, what was life like for you? You were on top of the world, celebrated across our country, throughout the NHL. What were things like? Oh, they were crazy. I remember I was come up to a stoplight just after I got home and the guy in the next car looked at me. Oh my God, he gets out of his car and, I, and won my autograph. Well, the light went green, of course. We were right on the front two lines. And, uh, and the guy said, shut up, it's Paul Henderson. Another guy jumped out of his car. <laughs> and, I mean, it was bizarre. It was just everybody and anybody. And, uh, and it really invaded our, like we tried to go out for dinner and people would, you know, oh my, we can't. And anyway, it was tough. It really was tough. And then what, what happened when we come back, uh, I, I could just, if the game was tied near the end of the game, I could just, you could just see people, you know, Henderson. And, 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 and I tried to do things that I shouldn't have been trying to do, tried to do too much. And that never works at hockey. And so I went through a pretty tough time. And, and I, you know, it, it, and Ballard, we lost half our team to the WHA. We had no chance of, you know, winning the Stanley Cup. And so it, I was a pretty, it, it went from this high to just that low uh, very, very quickly. And I pulled my groin in the last game and I came back and I was still struggling with that. And, but of course, they didn't want you to take any time off. So it was difficult, really, really, really. I mean, in one sense, it was great. The other sense, it wasn't. All right, this is a, a longer question, but <clears throat> just listen to me here. Uh, the Bible says that God created us and loves us and wants us to have a relationship with him. And, uh, but how does he get our attention? And I was thinking about this. Um, he gave the apostle Peter his greatest catch ever, a net full of fish. And when that happened, uh, Peter fell at his knees and he realized that Jesus was Lord and then he, he followed him. And I've been thinking like you had a net full of pucks in, in, in Russia with seven goals, especially the last one. And um, do, you, do you think at all that, that that was part of God's way of reaching you? Did, did you ever wonder like, why you? <laughs> I thought of that many times when I was not a Christian in 1972. And, and thank goodness that Mel Stevens, much, most of you know him, knocked on my door in the winter of 73 and asked me to work on his hockey school. And I did that. So I asked him, what do you pay? What do you pay? And he said, well, we don't have enough money to pay. And uh, we ask our guys to you know, donate their time. Do you not know who you're talking to? You know, it's just, that's what I felt, honest to God. And then Mel said to me, you know, Paul, I see you interviewed on television and you always seem to have an edge to yourself. And he said, I've done a little research on you and they tell me you've got a great family life and obviously a toast of the country. He said, to me, you seem like you should be one very happy guy, but you don't seem to be very happy. And I, Am I wearing a sign? No one ever had said that to me in my life before. And then we got into a little bit of a conversation. And then he said, you know, Paul, you can learn to live lightly. And I told him, I actually said this to him, if you had to, hear, if you had to play for Harold Ballard, you'd be pissed off too, okay? And so that was my excuse. And so when he said that you can learn to live lightly and freely, but you got to look at the spiritual side of life. And I said, I'm not into that 
I don't talk about politics and I don't talk about religion because you just end up in an argument. And, he, and I said, I've tried to read the Bible, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And he said, well, Paul, if you want to look into it, I'll help you. I'll get you a modern, a, a modern translation and I'll meet with you and I'll answer your questions because I had a lot of questions. And so for the next two years, actually 26 months, I almost met with, Al, uh, with Mel every week, but he finally got to the point where he says, Paul, you just need to, is Jesus who he says he is? Because if Jesus is who he says he is, he loves you and he wants you to get to know him. And so he said that, and, 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 and you know, I said, man, I've tried. And, and so make a long story short, I spent, I became a student of the Bible. And I did, the only guy that knew that I was looking into this was Ronnie Ellis. And we would go on the road and, road and I would take my Playboy and I would put my Bible inside the Playboy and I would lean against the window and I was reading my Bible. I was embarrassed. I didn't want anybody to know that I was doing this. Imagine that. <laughs> and my roommate, when I was rooming with, and I won't say who it was, but it wasn't Ronnie, I'd put my Bible on the floor, turn my light on, and I'd read the Bible on the floor. <laughs> but anyway, I finally, in, I finally really, one day I got, well, it was actually Mel, Mel's birthday. I got up that morning and Mel had taught me to get up in the morning and read your Bible and ask God for help and everything and just talk to God the way you would talk to your wife. And so I got up this morning and and I had no intention of doing it, but I said, you know, Lord, I've been looking into this for a long time, and I really believe you are who you say you are. I'm convinced that you willingly went to the cross and died for me. And Mel says that you'll wipe the slate clean. You'll forgive me of everything I've done wrong. And man, oh man, I had a bunch of things that I needed forgiveness for. And so I asked them to forgive me, and Mel and so I asked him, help me become the man you want me to become. And then I said, just, and I didn't think about it. I said, don't you ever expect me to tell anybody about this because I'm going to be a secret service Christian. <laughs> now, Eleanor, when I was looking into this, she was very, Eleanor always went to church, always was a nice person, everything, but she was worried about me that Mel, she was really cold toward Mike, because she knows either I do something well or I don't do it. And she was very, very nervous. Oh my God, he's going to become a Christian. He'll give all our money away and we'll go and live in Africa or something. <laughs> and so it took me three days to drum up enough courage to tell her. And so I sat her down in the kitchen and honest to God, my armpits were soaking. It, it was like my heart, my heart was pounding. And I said to her, you know, Eleanor, I've become a Christian. I've given my life to Jesus. And she looked at me and she said, oh, wonderful, and got up and walked out. Well, I finally told Mel about it. It took me about a week to tell Mel about it. And, you know, he congratulated. And Mel says to me, and I told her Eleanor's reaction. And he said, Paul, don't start preaching at her or anything like that just love her the way you have okay and so but i'm not that laid back and so i would leave an open bible on her pillow <laughs> don't ever do that honest god made so many mistakes it was a joke but anyway uh yeah it uh and and very and you know what guys god changed me it was unbelievable and thank goodness we started a bible study in our home Mel led it, and we had a bunch of athletes, and just uh, Chuck Ely and uh, Peter Peter Mueller and Aunt Zanard and Andrusitians. We started a Bible study in our house, and that's where we started to really grow. Well, it's amazing uh, how God has used you uh, through these many years, and um, but in uh, I think it was two thousand and nine. Now, just, uh, you know, I was reflecting on this, that how you had battled to make the team, you battled to beat the Soviets, you battled to, in your own soul about the existence of God, but now you had another battle, and, and uh, this time with the dreaded disease of, of cancer. Um, 
how did your relationship with Jesus help you through that time? Well, I, I, I was so fortunate. When I went to Birmingham, Alabama, I got a mentor down there named John Bradford, a businessman. And I met with him in, we got, there was about eight of us. And he met with us for three more, three years in a, uh, we met from 6.30 to 8 o'clock. And he modeled for me what it looked like to be a godly man. He was a very successful businessman. But his love for the Lord came out as pores. And I became close friends with him and our wives. We, we did a lot of things uh, together. And he really taught me how to just lean on God for everything. And even we, we used to meet at 530 and he ran a big business and he would get a, he'd spend 45 minutes with the Lord before he would even come and, and teach us. And he would say, I don't trust myself, Paul. I, I just I trust God to, to help me do it. And, and he had a profound impact in terms of being a husband, a father or everything. And he modeled it uh, 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 for me. And so when cancer came along, like I have no fear of dying. Like I, I've already started my eternal life and it's just the day I die. I'm just, you know, I'll, I'll start my eternal life there. And so when you, when you really get God into your life and it took, it took several years to be, to get to this obviously place, but uh, I, I, okay, Lord, you, I believe, and I'm firmly convinced I'm not going to live a day longer than the Lord wants me to, or a day less. And, and in, you know, John 16, 33 was one of the first verses that we memorized in that group. And you all know what it says. In this world, you will have trouble. But you can have heart can I'll, because I can overcome the world for you. And so there was no, I had no fear whatsoever. Okay, we've got cancer. Let's, we'll take one step at a time and down the road. And, and now I look back on it and. Like I, at one point, I, I was diagnosed in 09, and by 12, I'd lost 30 pounds. In fact, one of my buddies, Ricky Gates at Mississauga, we played golf one day, and he went home and told his wife, I don't think, I think Henny has played his last game. He just, you know, I was, looked like I, well, I had gray look and everything like that. But then I got it, and the only thing they offered me in Canada was chemotherapy. And I knew my body. I could never, it, my life would be over anyway. But then I got into a, a clinical trial in Bethesda, Maryland. And you had to be in terrible shape to get into it. And I got it. And that saved my life. And, uh, uh, and so it went down the road. But, but it's really, you know, it's, they say, you know, when, when you really have to, and when you, you got a good, they told me initially I might have five years to live. Well, I was 66 at the time. And my dad died at 49 and my sister at 48. The Henderson gene is not good. And so, well, that's not bad. And uh, there, you, okay, we'll take. And I said to Eleanor, we're not letting cancer define us. We're going to go and live our life the way we have and try to be a blessing to other people. And then one day at a time, and then all of a sudden now, my blood works as good as it's, it's ever been. And uh, I still have cancer, but one day at a time. And I, I still pray, even this morning, Lord, if you want to come back, this would be a good day to do it. I am so looking forward to it. Hey, it's so great to hear uh, how your, your walk with the Lord, your relationship with him, uh, it carries you through life and especially uh, through the, uh, the, the battle with cancer and, and your positive attitude is, is just awesome. Now, how would, I know you have many opportunities to do this, but how do you uh, explain uh, to people how they can have that relationship uh, with the Lord that, that you have? Well, the same way that uh, Mel told me, I do the same thing every time when I get talking to a person. And of course, I ask them where they are spiritually, but, you know, I, I really believe that God created us to have a relationship with him. He created us to spend eternity with him, and he just wants us to get to know him. And so I encourage them uh, that, uh, that, you know, ask questions. Find somebody. If you know somebody that uh, loves the Lord, go and sit down with him or ask questions. 
And then, but but the bottom line is, uh, and, and it, 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 we're built for relationship and you can never live this life on your own. And that's why you need other people around you. So I would encourage them to go and ask them and then find out what, you know, how to love Jesus and let him into your life. And so it's all of a process. And, you know, the, the thing, I've been on this journey since Mel led me to the Lord. And I still, like, I still, it doesn't matter. I could get better every day if I leave another 20 years. No one ever arrives. And God wants you to enjoy each and every day. He said, I came that you would have life and have it abundantly. And so, God says, forgive yourself. I used to beat myself up like crazy when I'd screw up or anything like that. And, and, and I would get down on myself. And God says, don't do that, honey. <laughs> Ask forgiveness. God forgives you from everything. He does, he, he does, he's not after perfection because he knows we'll never. The Bible says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Can any of you identify with that? Mm -hmm. And so... I get up every morning and I unashamedly ask for help. Lord, save me from myself and the devil. Help me to be the man you want me to be. And then I really re re relax and then go enjoy the process. And Ozzy and I love it when we can beat the guards in, in West Jerks. That's one of our better days down here. Okay. <laughs> well, Henny, uh, uh, you, you, you've been a part of our alumni group here, and uh, you're part of the leadership team and uh, a sincere and caring friend to many in our group. Maybe just a comment about the group. Maybe there are others uh, that, who would like to join us. To, what the group is, has meant to you? Well, it, it, and it's like it's fellowship. And iron sharpens iron. It really does. And, and, but the best thing about this is the convincing that goes on. You know, like, uh, I just love the camaraderie. And uh, Bernsey, I just love you. I mean, he, he, poor Bun, he takes us, he takes a beating and Baxi. I mean, it, it, it's just, there's just such a wonderful time. And you see guys, and that uh, Ernie Wakelet, I look at that old fart. And he was my, he was my roommate in, uh, in, uh, in Birmingham. And we had, I took Ernie over to meet John Bradford and took him over to dinner. And so he knows how, what a great man he was. But, and so, you know, that's why we're here, guys. And if you're on this call today, I would encourage you just to come and check it out. Check it out a couple of times. And, and in my ministry, we, we ask guys to come into the group. We ask them to try it four times. And if you're not getting anything out of it, quit. But uh, and so that's what I would encourage guys. If you're on the call today and you don't have a spiritual dimension in your life, just join us here. And, and, and if you want to talk to any of us, I mean, we got a lot of people on here a lot smarter than I am. And they haven't had six concussions like I have. And so we can, you know, line you up with somebody, Bun or Bosch down there. I mean, what a great guy he is, too. We've got so many guys that are down the road and. And Butters, can you believe Butters? I mean, the guy is so such a gifted communicator. And that sucker said to me one time, watch out for Henderson, he'll hit you with his Bible. I want to kill a sucker, but he was tougher than I am, so I couldn't do that. <laughs> so anyway, if you're on the call today, join us a few times. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, uh, Paul, for sharing your, your life and your heart with us today. And uh, God bless you and Eleanor and your, and your dear family. And now I'm going to call on that same Billy Butters, who's right next to you on the screen. And uh, he could, uh, he could probably uh, reach out and Henny, you could hit him with your Bible right now if you want to try. <laughs> but uh, Billy, you're, uh, you, you're going to do a close for us here. So you're on, Billy. Thanks, Donna. Thanks, Paul. And, uh, and actually, Paul did hit me with his Bible. I, I did approach him, and uh, he actually sent me a letter, and he sent me a book by C.S. Lewis that was way over my head, but I did read it. It was called Mere Christianity, and that was the start of my uh, faith walk, which led me to a hockey ministries camp, and then that summer, me asking Christ into my life. So, Henny, Thank you for having a little bit of passion in your life. And uh, 
thank you for not staying a secret service Christian. Um, it, it's great to see, see you and listen to you. You bring so much joy and passion to the game and, uh, just thanks for your story about the, even though I was an American, I watched the Canada series because uh, I was a hockey guy. So thank you for sharing those highlights of your life with us. And, and uh, John 20, I'm going to read that for you guys. Um, it says this in uh, verses 30 and 31. Jesus did many other miracles, miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And you just saw what believing in Christ has done for Paul. It's given him a new life, an abundant life. It's helped him battle the hard knocks he's had and the celebrations in his life. So if you need to contact anyone in hockey ministries or just need some help and want to have a chat with someone, please, um, please do that.